Okay, and I thank everybody for your patience. Our next speaker is Peter Rialli. Peter is a board member of the Scientific Coalition of UAP Studies. He's a retired electrical design engineer and manager from Silicon Valley. At Silicon Valley, his specialty was in telecommunications, information technologies, where he designed network communication systems, fiber optic ring networks, and timing synchronization. Further, he earned his bachelor's and master's in electrical engineering from the University of California, Berkeley. So Peter, uh, I'd like to turn it over to you. Well, thank you. Uh, I wanna thank the uh, AIAA for having us here today uh, for this uh, you know, important event. Um, as I said, my name is Peter Rialli. I'm with the Scientific Coalition of UAP Studies, which uh, is, um, you know, been in existence for a few years now. Uh, and we're dedicated to uh, trying to put a scientific basis on understanding these phenomena. So next slide. Since you've already uh, introduced me, I'll just go to the next slide. Okay, uh, I'm gonna be talking today about uh, the uh, Nimitz event, which has been covered a little bit already before. Uh, the Nimitz event in 2004 is probably one of the best uh, documented cases. There, uh, it's been, uh, uh, it, it, you know, it's been uh, it's six pilots and two uh, very qualified uh, radar operators have testified that this is a, uh, a valid event that really happened. Uh, and uh, so I'll be talking more about them later. Uh, next slide. Okay, so uh, the, the background on, the, on this was there was going to be a naval exercise in 2004 with the air, aircraft carrier uh, USS Nimitz and its uh, surrounding ships. And uh, these objects had been, uh, uh, been observed for a few days before the actual exercise by Kevin Day, who's already been mentioned uh, here. He was a chief, uh, uh, he was in charge of the radar. And the, uh, the, the objects were descending from 80,000 feet to 28,000 and then from 28 down to the surface and going very, very erratic behavior. And there were groups of them. Uh, and uh, so the, the exercise was canceled. And, uh, you know, it, it, the radar uh, had been calibrated for the few days before they'd been calibrating it many times. And this is a very advanced radar, SPY-1 radar, uh, you know, phase array radar, top, uh, very, very uh, state-of-the-art at the time. Uh, next slide. Okay, the methods we used as a forensic analysis, we, uh, uh, the, the, the SCU was uh, investigating this case a year before it came out in the New York Times. And we've uh, interviewed uh, uh, several of the people involved in it. We've done FOIA studies. Uh, you know, we also have done a lot of kinematic analysis based on the reported uh, um, uh, measurements that were taken. And we do a statistical analysis, a null hypothesis which is, uh, and basically what we're trying to show is uh, try and prove that this is a misidentified conventional object using conventional physics. That's the approach. And if we can't do that, then it has to be anomalous. So next slide. Uh, there were three uh, basic encounters uh, in, in this uh, particular, the, in the Nimitz event. The first encounter was uh, by the radar operators, uh, David, uh, David Day and Gary Voris which was uh, we already talked about. The second was uh, uh, when, the, when the actual uh, event was uh, uh, canceled, uh, the, the exercise, they sent out uh, uh, a, a two planes uh, by uh, David Fraber was the commander of them. And he actually descended down and got a close up of the object. And, and that's where the, the Tic Tac visualization has come from. The third was uh, after they returned to the uh, Nimitz aircraft carrier, they sent up another uh, plane with two pilots and they, with a flare camera, which is their uh, video camera, it's an infrared camera a targeting pod. They actually captured a video of the object. And that was done by, uh, recently came out, uh, the pilot has testified to a Chad Underwood. Next slide, please. Okay, we use uh, two kinematic analysis from basic physics. Uh, Assuming the, as mentioned before, the objects would hover uh, at either either alt high altitude or at sea level. They would then rocket up uh, to uh, the halfway point and then uh, start decreasing their velocity to hover at the other point. 
And so we assume two uh, kinematic uh, uh, analysis here, one for a, um, a linear velocity and next slide, the other for a parabolic velocity because at the center point, the halfway point for the uh, linear velocity, there would be a huge acceleration change. So it was trying to make it, how could we make this so you could do this with a rocket engine in conventional physics? And it turns out that the, uh, you know, it doesn't make a lot of difference. Uh, you trade one thing for another. Uh, uh, so uh, next slide. We also calculate the power requirements for this uh, based on conventional Newtonian physics, basically force times velocity. And uh, since we had the calculated velocities and accelerations, and uh, we assume in this case, we don't know the mass of the object. We assume very conservative mass of one ton. And um, uh, whereas like an F-18 airplane, which could be probably been the only other plane that could have been in the vicinity during this exercise because it's a restricted area, weighs 16 tons uh, unfueled. So that we, we did a very, some kind of advanced uh, conventional technology of one ton. Next slide, please. The results were, uh, again, these amazing, um, uh, you know, unbelievable uh, velocities, accelerations, and power. So uh, because it was said to, uh, uh, you know, it, it was 0.78 seconds for it to uh, descend, we, we, we took a, uh, you know, a devil's advocate and said, well, what if it's uh, six seconds, you know, it was mistaken or something like that. The net result is that the, for the six seconds, the most uh, very conservative is that the uh, Velocity was uh, between uh, 16,600 miles per hour and 10,227 miles per hour. For the 0.78 seconds, it was, was 104,895 miles per hour to 78,409 miles per hour. For the acceleration was, uh, for the six second was between 204 Gs to 310 Gs. And for the 0.78 seconds, it's 12,250 Gs to 18,385 Gs, depending on, uh, of course, the uh, assumed uh, kinematics of it, assumed, uh, you know, um, uh, how, how the thing is accelerating, which we don't know, but we know what the averages are, so we can assume these two different uh, trajectories. The power is, is, out of, is just phenomenal. Uh, th that's, the, to my mind, the most anomalous thing about it is the power because there's no uh, conservation of energy says this must be released to the atmosphere. Yet the power uh, for the most conservative six second case varied between 11.3 gigawatts and 9.75 gigawatts. Now to put this in perspective, a gigawatt is a good size nuclear um, power station. Maybe one to one and a half gigawatts is what they produce. So this would be 11 of them. And for um, uh, for the linear case, uh, it's phenomenal. It's 5,126 gigawatts and, uh, and for, or 4,440 uh, 4, gigawatts. This is equivalent to about a 1.05 kiloton uh, uh, of TNT being detonated per second, like a small tactical nuclear weapon. Next slide. The conclusions are no human could sustain the calculated 170 pound human would be subjected to a force of 17.6 to 1,041 tons. It would kill anybody. Uh, a six second parabolic trajectory is equivalent to 2.3 tons of TNT being detonated each second. The 0.78 second parabolic trajectory is equivalent to a 1.05 kiloton tactical nuclear weapon being detonated each second. And again, there was no report of any uh, disturbance in the atmosphere. So the speed at maximum velocity, the equivalent to a meteorite entering the atmosphere from outer space, none of these effects were noticed by the personnel reporting this incident. Next slide, please. Okay, the second incident is uh, one of the most interesting, and that is when uh, Kevin Fravor, um, uh, sorry, uh, David Fravor, commander, uh, was command. He's the commander of a, of a, of a, a flight uh, wing a squadron. I think flight flight is the right term. Uh, and that was David Fravor, Jim Slate, and Lieutenant Commander Alex Dietrich, and one of their pilot who wishes to remain anonymous. All these people said this happened. They flew out uh, from the, the exercise off the coast of uh, Baja, California in uh, 2004. And when it was canceled, his, his plane, his two planes were sent out to investigate the radar images about 40 miles away from their cap point, which was the, um, the, the cap point is the, um, uh, terminology for where they do their exercise. They, 
they fly against one another and practice. They were going to be heading over to the Middle East for, uh, uh, you know, for their uh, deployment. They flew out uh, to uh, 40 miles out and um, at, uh, at, out at the uh, uh, point, uh, probably hard to see the number there, but at 40 miles out, uh, David Fravor was alerted down below on the water was this white uh, disturbance on the water and he noticed this object bouncing around. So he decided to uh, descend and keep the other plane up above. He descended down to about eight to 10,000 feet. And uh, at that point, the object, uh, he could see the object it was this uh, tubular object, and it, it sort of noticed him and, and it, it, it moved out uh, in, 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 in an opposite direction. So he decided to cross and intercept the object. When he started crossing over to intercept the object, the object shot off and uh, described as like shot from a gun. Uh, you know, so that, uh, you know, that there was no timing except shot from a gun, which means usually you can't see, see it. Uh, a few sec, a few short time later, I'll say, the radar operators said that the object was back at the cap point, so it had traveled 40 miles horizontally and vertically, you know, also with a vertical altitude probably of 10,000 feet in a very short amount of time, uh, in its seconds perhaps. Next slide. So this is what, how it was described. Uh, this is from a video by Dave Beatty. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, like I say, a, something like, a, you know, a, uh, a natural gas tank with some, uh, some appendages on the bottom. Next slide, please. Now, uh, shooting out of sight could be due to two things. And uh, we took those into account. One is it shot over the horizon. The second one was uh, visual acuity of the, opera, of the eyesight. Now, a human, a good eyesight, you can see one sixtieth, one sixtieth of a degree, a one arc minute. And after that, you can't really begin to recognize it. And also the objects described between 56 to 60 feet, uh, 60 feet long. And uh, we, what we did is this thing could have been traveling at different angles. So we considered uh, 60 feet, 30 feet, 50 feet, because you know, it, it, it could be observed in different aspect ratios. Also, we considered uh, calculations for between very good vision of uh, one sixty of a degree down to one fifteenth of a degree. Um, and so, uh, uh, next slide. So for the uh, over the horizon, we uh, it's very easy to calculate the horizon is at different altitudes. We found that it can't that can't be the case because uh, at ten to eight thousand feet, the horizon is more than hundred miles away, and uh, the the object showed up at the uh, forty mile distance. So next slide. So uh, for the uh, visual acuity, we uh, took all those factors into account we were using a little bit of uh, trigonometry. We could calculate the, um, um, you know, the, the, the uh, you know, the distance and the time required. We, since shot from a gun is uh, a little bit nebulous, we calculated for a series of different times, uh, 0.2 seconds, 0.5 seconds, 2.5 and 5 seconds. And I'll talk about 0.5 and 5 seconds. Now, the reason is 0.5 seconds from psychological studies is about the time you can notice, it takes for the brain to notice changes uh, in uh, uh, perception that has been measured. And five seconds is nobody can really say, five seconds probably at the limit that you would say something shot from a gun. So uh, next slide. What we got for that uh, calculation was uh, um, another more astounding uh, uh, you know, characteristics. For the half second, which is the, um, you know, shot from a gun, uh, the, um, the maximum accelerations varied from 84,000, 83,400 Gs to 800, uh, to uh, 3,202 Gs. And the, um, uh, for the uh, not shot from a gun, the five second one, it varied from 834 G's to 32 G's. All of these uh, would destroy an airplane. Uh, for the power, uh, maximum power uh, for the, uh, for the uh, shot from a gun was uh, 1.71 times 10 to the uh, fifth gigawatts. And um, uh, again, um, assuming a one, we're here, we're assuming a one uh, ton uh, mass with weight, but he converted to mass. And uh, so we get 1.71 times 10 to the fifth gigawatts. And remember a gigawatt is a nuclear power station. 
and for the uh, minimum one point, uh, you know, one, uh, one thousand two hundred ninety gigawatts for the not um, for you know for the not shot from a gun, it uh, it varies from uh, one hundred seventy one gigawatts to uh, one point two nine gigawatts, all uh, anomalous. So uh, next slide. So uh, the final conclusions are the blind point distance wasn't determined to be, uh, you know, due to physical acuity. Uh, looking at the acceleration in all cases would be intolerable to human pilots. In most likely cases, any mechanically complicated mechanism would disintegrate due to the excessive forces. Certainly any airplane would not survive. The power dissipate of any known uh, type of heat engine would have caused noticeable, highly visible effects uh, to the NIMG strike group, um, you know, note, you know, uh, you know, due to conservation of energy, uh, that, that kind of energy has to go somewhere. Uh, five, the only component of velocity and acceleration considered was the horizontal trajectory. In the first case, we considered the vertical, so you'd have to add that as well, so there'd be even more energy. Uh, we're just trying to show, uh, do the simple calculations that show the anomalous effect. Uh, the null hypoth hypothesis event that this uh, event is explained by known objects that were misidentified can't be substantiated. So the objects remain unknown of, or of unknown origin and technology. Next slide, please. The third one is the encounter uh, by Chad Underwood where he, um, he, he with his flare camera, uh, his targeting pod, um, actually, um, you know, got a video of it. He did not see the, the object. Uh, he was far enough away but it's caught it on his, his flare camera and it was doing the same behaviors as described. Uh, he has recently uh, come out and done a video and in several interviews talking about this. Um, uh, he, he remained quiet for quite a few years until this all became public and then he finally came out. And this shows a targeting pod which mounts under the plane on the left. On the right is the screen that the pilots see with the metadata and an example of, uh, we had to study the metadata to understand uh, what the different uh, parts are. A lot of this is not very easy to do because much of this is classified. Uh, further, uh, uh, an important point that is often left out about this is uh, when these, uh, you know, when these objects were, were uh, viewed, they were using a um, uh, narrow field of view, which is about 0.7 angular degrees. And this is equivalent to a telescope of about 80, uh, perhaps 80 power, 100 power. So they, they can see objects miles away uh, and you know this has been testified with multiple pilots so, uh, next slide please here's an example of what you would see of um, these are stealth aircraft the f-35 and the b-2 bomber you can see in infrared they're they're not uh, invisible they're invisible radar or pretty much invisible radar not perfect but uh, you know very hard to detect and you can see clearly see the outlines you can, you can, because uh, as the objects move through the atmosphere, they're heated. And so uh, in this case, white is, is hotter than the, uh, than the background. And so you can actually see on the left, the F-35, you can see the exhaust coming out of its tail and it's, it, you know, characteristics of it. And so um, uh, as, you know, th this is with, uh, uh, you know, the infrared characteristics. Uh, next slide, please. Now, this is how we calculated the uh, trajectory um, based on this. Since uh, on the left is the uh, sensor, or we could also be used like a human eyeball. And we know the, uh, uh, you know, we know the field of view of the camera. And um, we also know the es estimated size of the object. So using trigonometry, you can estimate um, the, uh, uh, for different distances and, and the same size object, you can actually uh, estimate the field of view that the object travels through. And uh, on the screen, we divide the object into uh, 12 reticles, 12 divisions. The object takes up a certain amount of uh, space on this. And so you can calculate on, if you know the timing, which I'll talk about next, um, you can actually calculate the speed and, uh, and acceleration. We again use um, the linear, in, in this case, we use basically the linear velocity approach because we know the averages and it's just, it's just a uh, convenient way to, to treat it because we don't know the real trajectory, but it has to be something on the, on this uh, order of magnitude. Next slide. Two minutes. Ne next slide. Okay. Uh, in this in this case, uh, this shows the framing. With the framing, we uh, 
uh, we can determine the timing of uh, how the object moves through the object, uh, through the uh, screen and get the timing for the object. Next, next slide, please. In this case, we have two things to deal with here. The size of the object uh, viewed on the screen, it has a dense center and then a corona around it. So we had to uh, deal with two sizes, we, the two diameters, we did calculations for both. The second was a complication. As it moves to the left, the pilot uh, uh, increased the zoom. So during the uh, X2 portion of the screen, you have to, the distances have to be halved. And um, um, next slide. And that result is uh, these graphs are for uh, two, two um, uh, what we call early zoom, late zoom. I won't talk about the late zoom because it's, it's, it's uh, uh, really unrealistic. It was done just to uh, you know, emphasize, uh, just to have a sort of a devil's advocate against it. The, the, the realistic and most conservative is the early zoom case. And the plane flies at 30 to, uh, I mean, the object flies at 30 to 110 Gs. Next slide. In this case, the power requirement, you can calculate the available power of an F-18, uh, which could, is the only plane possible in the area. And it's also similar to probably even any other kind of uh, advanced jet. And uh, it only had one to 34% of the needed power to perform the observed accelerations. The same with uh, the, the late zoom, even less, uh, 0.8 to 4.5%. So it can't, uh, you know, uh, next slide. Okay, so here's the conclusions. Uh, the Tic Tacs are not uh, aircraft of any known type, exhibit technological capability beyond anything that existed in 2004 or that exists today. Tic Tacs exhibit at least one of the following characteristics. No aerodynamic airframe, no obvious means of reactive propulsion, acceleration characteristics beyond human endurance and airframe structure capability. Uh, if three, if the apparent movement of the left is due to vibration of the airplane, well, basically what this is saying is that the, the only reason you can lose lock is through, is through excessive acceleration to the left. The fourth one is Tic Tacs for a missile. It would be smaller and closer to the plane and it would not have acceleration calculated in the flare display as shown above. Um, next slide. The Tic Tacs were a missile or an airplane. As it moved left, it would have to bank, well, the plane would bank and the missile would show its longer uh, edge and the diameter of the image of the flare display would uh, move left and it does not happen. Uh, if the Tic Tacs were F-18 size aircraft, it would be between 18 and 33 miles from the flare camera. And with this telescopic capability, it would be capable of uh, identifying it by its shape or certainly by the external dimensions of the image on the screen. The size would be able to be calculated and we'd have shown above. Seven, the Tic Tacs demonstrate accelerations greater than 40 Gs and most likely much higher with no noticeable effect on their structure or performance. Here we are using the early zoom figures from table one as the most conservative. Eight, the flare is capable of registering the maximum dimensions of aircraft airframes and showing that the, uh, the aircraft structures that support lift and maneuver functions are none are observed. There's no lift capability. Nine, the F-18 does not have adequate power to exhibit even the minimal required acceleration for the maneuvers that are observed in the video. And I think I'll stop here. All right, Peter, thank you. We have about uh, roughly three and a half minutes for questions. So please, anyone go ahead and uh, for Peter. Peter, well, it's, it's, uh, sorry. I'm sorry, I go ahead. Yeah, I have a question, it's Philip Iris talking. Peter, just a question. If you would have had to ask the military some uh, related data, which ones would you consider studying? The radar data as a first priority or something else? I had a little trouble understanding what, what your question is. What, what I'm sorry. Yeah, if you would, uh, uh, if it would be possible for you to ask military, the data from mil the military, what kind of data would be the first uh, objective? Like the radar data would be the most important to study? What's the most important data to study? Yes. Um, well, I, we'd like to have the radar. Uh, we'd like to have radar and um, uh, actually the, um, uh, we'd actually like to have, you know, this is only a small part of the, of the uh, videos that were taken. And we'd like to have a whole video you know, and, and see, uh, you know, many of these things, 
we only get little snippets of it. And there's, uh, you know, so we'd like to have radar and any kind of RF uh, uh, measurements they have, uh, but basically any of the data, you know, that it all's just, you know, we have almost nothing, you know, we have to scrounge around to get anything, you know, and, and uh, that's you know, basically about all I can say. Thanks, Peter. All right, Peter, I was going to be asking you just uh, from the point of view of this, would you consider that in a generic sense, one of your greatest challenges for what you're doing? Yes, uh, the, uh, the inability to have the, the hard data to, under, to, to get and the, uh, you know, ha not having the data to analyze is very difficult. Um, we have to uh, you go to extreme measures and uh, to, you know, to, to uh, we have to make assumptions that if we had the data, we wouldn't have to make. And they're, they're good assumptions, you know, but they're, they're not, uh, you know, they're not, uh, they don't really dial into the actually what, you know, what's going on. You know, they, they're very broad and they just show that things are anomalous, but we'd like to have more detail on this. And, uh, it, you know, it's, most of this stuff is classified, but they could be released. This data could be released and scrub the classification part of it and just give us the data, you know. Uh, how you got the data is not, you know, uh, details about your instrument and stuff and uh, is not so as, as important. Although perhaps some of the giving away some of this stuff, uh, you know, might reveal some secrets. But, you know, this was 2004, this data. It was 2004. So they, they've made, uh, you know, things advance quite a bit. So you could, uh, you know, it probably, I'm, I'm sure that uh, by this time, it's not that classified, but once things get classified, it's very difficult to overcome that. All right, Peter, thank you. And with that, that'll conclude our first portion of our three speakers that covered the technical characteristics of UAP. We'll engage now into a 10 minute break and then pick up with our next set of speakers, which will be covering the safety implications of UAP. The break will be approximately 10 minutes now, uh, excuse me, 10 minutes, and we'll be starting now. 